mast cells. Prior to about five, six years ago, we did not understand the importance of mast cells in inflammation in the central nervous system. Mast cells are a type of white cell. They're a granulocyte. They're part of the immune system and, as it turns out, the neuroimmune system. They're common in areas in close contact to external environments, the skin, the gastrointestinal tract, and airways. Okay? These guys are what's kicking off when you've got asthma, allergic asthma. These guys are what's kicking off when you have hives and rashes. Okay, so this is the histamine release. When your eyes are watery and your nose is running, histamine release is being mediated by mast cells. It's distributed in all organs and vascular tissue, and this is important because these guys create really wide-ranging symptoms in the body. They can move across the blood-brain barrier both when the brain is healthy and when there's problems with disease. And it looks like, in some early studies now, that the first immune response in the central nervous system may be this. So the mast cells then turn on the microglia, and the microglia then go on and do their thing. So this becomes a very important piece of the inflammatory cascade in the central nervous system. Mast cells release a whole series of immune modulators, chemotactins, vasoactive compounds, neuropeptides, and growth factors in response to allergens, pathogens, emotional stress, tissue damage, constituting a first line of host defense. Okay, we just had to add allergens to our list of potential, if not damps and pamps, somewhere in between the two of those things. Okay, so now we've got another set of things we have to pay attention to that are potentially feeding into the whole chronic pain problem. This is just a list of the types of compounds that they can, be, that they can release in the molecules. What's really important here is not so much for us this evening, but long term it helps gives us some insight about what our targets are. What are we going to go after in order to shut the process down? We have to know how the cells work. We have to know what factors they kick out in order to be able to respond to them and begin to understand how we quiet the inflammatory process. There's a condition now recognized as mast cell activation syndrome. And mast cell activation syndrome turns out probably to be the largest uh, number of people struggling uh, with mast cell problems. So we have systemic mastocytosis, cutaneous mastocytosis, urticaria is an angioedema, the swelling that occurs in the tissues, allergies and anaphylaxis, okay, and mast cell activation syndrome. This is the whole realm, if you will, of mast cell activation disorders. These are little tiny amounts. There's, they're really small amounts of the population that are affected by these. They're particularly nasty cancers. They're a problem, but the overwhelming majority of people will never see these. These we see a little bit more commonly. These we see very commonly, but what we've been overlooking for years is this. And this turns out to be an extremely important part of what we need to be looking at when we're talking about chronic pain and chronic illness problems. So mast cell activation syndrome is a condition featuring chronic, inappropriate, uh, non-neoplastic, non-cancer producing mast cell activation. So mast cells are kicking out all of these factors, but we don't know why. The mast cell activation syndromes result in multi-system signs and symptoms, including, but not limited to, gastrointestinal tract, cardiovascular, psychological, neurological, and genital urinary system. We know that one of the things coming out of mast cells is histamine. And we know that there are H1 receptors, H2 receptors, H3 and H4 receptors. We have lots of H1 and H2 receptors. We have one H3 receptor available on the market and no H4 receptors. So when we go after these things, we can use medications in order to help shut this down by picking the targets because we know what we're looking at. So in the H1 receptors, we know we're looking at uh, problems with uh, things like allergies, okay? And so we can use different compounds such the antihistamines, preferably the anti sedating antihistamines in order to shut it down. The H2 receptors, we see a lot of issues with stomach acid production, okay? And we can shut that down also with certain H2 receptors. Okay, so we have medications readily available for that. There is a new medication for treatment of uh, narcolepsy, which has just recently been approved, which is an H3 receptor blocker. 
nothing on H4. So as you see, as we start to address this issue, we're only going to get partway there. Partway is better than no way, but at least it's the beginning of the process, and you see where our holes are. This slide gives you an idea of the unbelievable array of symptoms that can occur as a result of mast cell activation disorder. You can see fatigue. All right, we may want to think about this as a problem for people presenting with chronic fatigue syndrome. Maybe what we're looking at is a mast cell activation disorder. Generalized malaise, weight loss, nasal congestion, nasal parietes, problems with shortness of breath, wheezing, neurologic, anxiety, depression. Why? Because it's part of the neuroimmune system and creates neuroinflammatory disease. Decreased concentration and memory, difficulty with focus and attention, the brain fog, mast cells can be mediating that, as well as microglia. Muscle skeletal, joint pain, muscle pain. Digestive issue, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, esophageal reflux. You see flushing, itching. All right, look at the whole number of symptoms that go on. And so we really need to be paying attention to this. The problem is we haven't got good ways to diagnose this. Pain syndromes that have been specifically cited in the literature associated with are significant. We see neuropathic pain, postoperative pain, irritable bowel syndrome, vulvodynia, venom induced, spiders and um, snake bites, self injurious behavior, which nobody's been able to quite explain, but this business of cutting behavior that we see, especially in kids and people who are severely depressed, seems also to have a mediation via. Um, mast cells. We see migraines have been associated with uh, mast cell activation disorder, chronic prostatitis, endometriosis, bladder plane syndrome, fibromyalgia, and cancer and sickle cell disease. These are all pain syndromes associated with mastocytosis, with, mast, uh, with mast, mast cell activation syndrome. So who was thinking of this prior to a few years ago? But when we're looking at these conditions and they're not responsive to anything else we're doing, maybe this is what we're missing. And so this is a whole nother leg on that stool for our understanding of chronic pain. So what if we're thinking about this all wrong? So in the spinal cord, this chronic inflammatory states result in neuropathic pain, myofascial pain, and we call this central sensitization. This is agreed upon terminology. I'm proposed in my book, and I've proposed in other articles, that the combination of both a chronic pain disorder and a neuropsychiatric condition should really be referred to as chronic centralization syndrome. And it is a neuroinflammatory, neurodysregulatory, and neurodegenerative process. That chronic pain and depression share common neurophysiology and biology. They're multiple reinforcing pathologies. They are much tougher to treat when you see both of them together. Depression and pain, so what we thought was depression and pain caused inflammation and dysregulation and degeneration of the brain, and now what we know is inflammation and dysregulation and degeneration of the brain actually cause depression and chronic pain. If you take nothing else away from this, understand that these are the symptoms, not the disease. The disease is inflammation in the central nervous system, and then we need to find out what set off that fire. The other thing that we know is that these things feed forward and feed back on each other. So we know that if this is going to be, if mast cells are going to be important, along with microglia and astrocytes, they must talk to each other. And indeed, the literature tells us that they do talk to each other, that there's feed forward and feedback loops in terms of these things, that they can significantly upregulate the inflammatory response, they can significantly make the inflammatory response worse, and they can keep it going even though the thing that set it off has gone away. So we see huge relationships back and forth between these things as they're chemically signaling each other. They work in concert. They are not isolated players. So the other thing this tells us is that if we're going to be successful in treating this, then we better be prepared to go after all of this. Because if we leave a wildfire burning in one place, it may reset everything else. So we've got to go after all of it. We're not so good at astrocytes. But we got a pretty clean shot at what's going on with microglia and at uh, mast cells.